Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, as Pastor Chris mentioned, we're talking about God's plans, and the title for today is A Trust-Filled Life. Uh, so you think about our day-to-day -day things, as you heard me talk to the kids just a little bit. Uh, I want to start with a picture from my recent trip to uh, Arizona. Uh, it's a night shot. You could, if, I'll have to show you a little bit better, but that, that's actually Venus brightening things up quite a bit. Uh, if I had the lights different, I guess I might try that next service, but you could see a lot of stars, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and this got me thinking about vacations in general, and I, I, I want you to go with me here. I think there's kind of two extremes that we have when you think of vacation planners, or vaca as you think about folks that get ready for vacations. On the one extreme, you have those who, who do plan them. And I mean plan them, right? Like they know if they got a week's long vacation, you know exactly where you're having lunch on the, the fourth day of the trip, and you know exactly what time you're gonna be there, and they got it planned down to the minute. Does anybody want to confess that's you today? Some of you got, yeah, okay, so <laughs> somebody's trying to help moms raise their hands. Uh, I have a friend like that, he's, he's got a binder when they go on family trips. I mean, this binder's thick and it's full of all sorts of stuff, and that's great, okay? I think it's good. Then you have another end, which is an area that I tend to identify with more, which is, just go. I know the general area I'm going, I, I got a plan to the extent that I got to get a plane ticket, maybe a car. I'm going to be honest, not even a hotel sometimes. Sometimes it's just like, well, we'll find something when we get there. Or in this case, when I get there, whatever. Okay, so you got, do I have any other kindred, just go types? Hey, I don't feel so bad. All right, good. Whew, that's good. Uh, so you got your, your planners, super planners on the end, some of us just goers. Uh, on the other end, and then there's a whole bunch of you left in the middle, somewhere between the just planets and the just go folks, right? Uh, and a lot of this comes down to our, our views on and our thinking about uh, the future, of how much there, we want to be able to control and take care of things. And I want you to think about that a little bit today, because regardless of whether we're the planet people or the just go people, we would, I think, each of us love to at the very least know what our future holds. Do we agree to that? Like, would it be nice to know, I mean, not to sound morbid, but we'd like to know what day we're going to go. Understand what I'm saying? Okay, without getting too morbid here. Uh, we'd like to know uh, when people are looking at different jobs or if they have different things, should I take this job or that job? Which one's going to have a better future for me? Uh, should I do this? Should I do that? We want to have a little bit of control. And actually, that's probably not even right. We would love to have a lot of control about what our futures hold. And we want to know so that we can plan properly for each step of the way. Because if this isn't going to pan out, well, gosh, I sure don't want to spend a lot of time on whatever this is in my future. And I think as we look at Scripture, we say that, that this is really this idea of wanting to be in control and wanting to know everything that's happening is the essence of mankind since, well, since Adam and Eve. Part of the desire for eating the fruit was that they would know and have knowledge like God, knowing good and evil and, and with it, all of the other things. They wanted to be able to make the decisions and know, and so do we. And in our reading today from Genesis, we see, and as you heard me talk to the kids a little bit, Abram did not get that luxury. Listen to what the Lord says to him. Now the Lord said to Abram, go. Go. From your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now imagine. So, so by the way, how many lifelong Lee County folks, you've never lived anywhere else besides Lee County. Right now your blood pressure is probably up a little bit. This idea that you would have to uproot this place that you've known all your life, the only place you have known, and just have to go. You don't, notice it didn't even tell you yet the destination. God hasn't told him where he's going. He just says, go. Go to the place that I'm going to show you from everything where your family is and everything you've known to this 
other place. Now, if you're a lifelong Lee County person, only lived here all your life, that probably makes you a little anxious. How many of you, on the other hand, have moved, well, let's say at least five times in your life? So this is probably not, no, no sweat. You're like, ah, I could pick up and go, no problem, God. Right? We wouldn't be have, you wouldn't have any anxiety about that. And, and again, there's this spectrum of folks between the always been here and always moving, and uh, you would have very different reactions. Abram's in that first group. There's the only place he's known, but God says go. And Abram says, all right, I'm uncomfortable, but I will go. Because God is leading. God is leading him. God says go do this, and Abram picks up and, and, and goes. And I want you to see that Abram trusted God because it was indeed God that was calling him. And that in this calling of Abram, God has revealed his plan at least the overarching plan for everything. Because understand that in the spectrum of folks, the, the just go and the planners, God is the ultimate planner. God had everything planned down. And here already, way back in Genesis 12, the planning can't get much older than this. We see that God has already got everything in place. He knew where he was leading Abram. Abram didn't have any idea. But God knew. And here God reveals the plan. So right here already in this first thing, and I'm going to share with you God's plan in these first few verses that Larry read for us. Right here we get the very first part of the plan. Now the Lord says to Abram, go from your country, from your kingdom place, and go to the, to the land. So God already has a destination in mind for Abram. I'm going to take you to this place. And this is the first one that you need to remember. Because by the end of this, you're going to see the three parts of this plan that God has. First is to give Abram this land. Later in the reading, it's, you, sh you share and see as Abram goes through and travels throughout the land and sets out the markers, the land becomes very important. So understand, first, God promises Abram a place. Second part of the plan, you heard in the reading right there in verse 2, and I will make of you a great nation. Now, to be a great nation right now, we have Abram and Sarah. Uh, would you consider two people to be considered a great nation? Just two of you? That, no, right? So there's this not anywhere near a great nation. What are they going to need to be considered a great nation? They're going to have to have a whole bunch of, whole bunch of other people. They're going to have to have a lot of descendants, and you're going to see as things unfold that they will have those descendants, but right now they're not. So I will make you a great nation. So the first part of the plan, God says, I'm going to give you the land. Hey, you're going to go to this land, I promise. I'm going to make you into a great nation. Second part of God's plan and the third part, and if you've been in one of our Bible studies recently, especially this on Genesis, the third part of the plan is this. And in you, in you, Abram, so this guy that I'm going to give the land to, this guy that I'm going to make into a great nation, the third part of the plan is in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I want you to see that something else important here that's going to come up for us a little bit later. God has a plan for Abram plan to give him a land, plan to make him into a great nation for a purpose. It's not just to bless Abram for these things. He chooses to give Abram the blessings. He could have chosen anybody. He chooses Abram to give him the land, to make him into a nation with the purpose of blessing who? Everybody. Way back in this time. Understand, this is a long time ago. This is Genesis. This is early Genesis. Thousands of years we're talking. And God says, Abram, I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to make you into a great nation. And through you, and through all of this work, I'm going to bless the entire world. That's God's plan. God's plan laid out for us early in Genesis. Here's, here's that summary. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going, to give, I'm going to make you be a blessing. Now, for those of you who are planners, when you think about the vacations that we plan, as we thought about that example earlier, a lot of the planners, and, and I'll admit there's times I like, to, I like to do the planning myself, when we do that, we like to take the worry and anxiety and all of the, the planning stuff out so that we can relax a little. So, so we could imagine, of course, then, as God has revealed his plan to Abram, everything was smooth after that. 
Abram didn't, had no troubles and followed God's plan exactly as it was. If you've been reading and you've been in Genesis, you know that's not the case. We saw right away that Abram did not follow God's plan. As a matter of fact, as you go through this story, uh, and as, as everything unfolds in Genesis, we see Abram struggle a whole bunch. Abram lies to different kings. He, he, he and his wife Sarah, Sarah apparently was very beautiful. And as they get to different places, and Abram's worried that they're going to do something to him because they see that his wife Sarah is beautiful, so he lies and he tells the kings, to tell, tells them that Sarah is his sister so that they won't hurt him, okay? And, and matter of fact, as, the, as all of this goes on, hold on, let me get to my, I got ahead of myself here. Um, as he gets, as, as the story unfolds with person after person after person, we see that they are having all sorts of trouble staying on God's plan. We have people cheating each other. We have brothers stealing inheritance. Uh, we have people lying to each other. It's the worst soap operas you can think of. All in these Old Testament stories, trouble after trouble after trouble, really gets down to, to one reason. Remember, God had this plan. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to make you a blessing. Abram should have trusted it. But, well, there was the word there. I spilled it. They didn't trust God. You know, when I asked the kids this just a little bit ago about lunch and dinner, none of them are worried that they're going to get lunch or dinner. Because, because why? They, they trust that mom or dad or grandma, grandpa, whoever is going to have lunch for them today. And Abram and Isaac and Jacob, as all of that story unfolds in Genesis, had trouble following God's plan because, because there was a, a trust issue within each of them. And I want you to see today, well, let me ask you this. Are, are you trusting God? How well do you trust God and everything that's going on in your life? God has indeed made promises to you, and, well, are you trusting him, or do you tend to be more like Abram and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and all those other folks? Do you, do you trust God with what's going on in your life? Want to, and I guess even to back up a little more than that, do you even know what the plan God has for you in your life? Understand that you are part of God's plan. Remember, when we get back to this and we said Abram's plan, to get, as or God's plan was to Abram, I'm going to give you the land, I'm going to give you, make you a nation, and I'm going to make you a blessing. And, and you are actually still part of that divine plan that God gave to Abram because, well, because you are part of the world. And the plan is, I might want to venture a guess because that was in our readings today too, The plan is here, is revealed again in this John reading. For God so loved, where? Who? The world. Who's the world? You, you are. You're part of it. For God so loved you that he gave his only son that because you believe in him, you will not perish but have eternal life. You are part of that divine plan. When God told Abraham he was going to bless the world through Abram, he was talking about you and he had you in mind. You are indeed part of God's plan then. And notice that when God blessed Abram, remember I said he gave him the land, he made him into a nation so that he would bless everybody else. So as God's plan unfolds for Abram to bless the world, the same is happening for you, right? That as he has chosen to bless you through Jesus, he indeed has something else in a way for you to continue to be a blessing, well, actually, let me back up for just a second. So, so he chooses to bless you, but, but why? I want you to think about that. Why does he choose to bless you? Why does he choose to save you, right? Because understand Jesus' work on the cross saves you from death. It saves you from an eternal death. So that, and, and the most easy reason is that, so that, well, because why? Because he, he loves you. And he wants you to be with him. He wants you to be with him for eternity. But until that day, I guess then what I want to ask is, what, what do we do now? God has indeed saved you. That is the promise. He loves you, loved you, loved the world so much that he gave up Jesus. 
to save you, and you have that salvation now that is yours by faith, but has he done it just so that we can sit here and listen to a sermon on Sunday morning? Is that why Jesus has saved us, just so we can sit here on, on Sunday mornings? Wait here week to week? Go to lunch afterwards, wherever that's going to be? I, I hope you know that the answer is no. This is not simply the reason that he saved it is He does love us, but not just to sit here. That is not the plan. Just to sit here and continue to receive those blessings and do nothing. Why did he save you? Well, there's another verse I want you to look at today from Ephesians 2. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, you might know the verses part prior to this, rather. For it is by grace you have been saved from faith, through faith. Okay, it goes to all that. And then it says this, verse 10. For we, for you are his workmanship. Right? He's been crafting, he's been doing something. He had a plan in mind for you, created in Christ Jesus for what? I want you to notice that as us Lutherans said the words good works, we did not explode. A lot of times us Lutherans get, us Lutherans get anxious, we start thinking about good works and stuff that we're supposed to do, but I want you to see in Ephesians 2.10, you are his workmanship. And, and again, reminder, right before this he said you were saved by grace. We understand that. You have been saved by Jesus. There's nothing you've done, but it has been for a purpose. You were created in Jesus to do good works. And notice what it says, and I love this as you think about the plan in today, which God did what? Prepared beforehand. So before he saved you, and as all this plan was unfolding, he has prepared everything so that you would do something. Now, who does he need you to do something for? Let me ask you this. Does God need you to do anything for him? Is he going to stop being God because... Robert Tyner failed to do something. No. Right? God is God and he is almighty, eternal, omnipotent. So, so who does God need you to do something for? If he's created you to do good works, who does, need, who does he need you to do something for? hope this is easy. Let's go to another verse. I summarized this one. When the disciples asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was, they wanted to know, they wanted to follow him. Jesus said the first and the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, right? Um, and the second part of that verse, though, that Jesus adds in was to love who? Your neighbor. God's plan was indeed, starts through Abraham. It, he gave Abraham the land. He made him into a great nation, and he blessed Abram through I blessed us all, the whole world, through Abram to call us to a purpose, to, to love him first and foremost, to know that we are loved by him, but to love your neighbor, not just to be the people that sit here on Sunday afternoon, but it is indeed good to come here. We need to come here because the world battles against us and the world says all sorts of things contrary to what God says. And so we need this place to be filled and refilled, to hear the forgiveness because we understand the struggles we have and to know above all else that God loves us. But then to go from this place full of that love, that grace and forgiveness and go into the world and love our neighbors. I don't know what that looks like for you. Exactly. I don't know which neighbors God has put you into contact with. Understand, what this means is that each of us has a place in the kingdom. Much like we just talked about with our vision focus plan, each of us has a role to fill. It may be that your role is pastor. Pastor Chris and I get that. It may be that your role is a, a, a parent, a grandparent, a husband, a wife, a police officer. Whatever your job is, whatever place God has put you, that is the place that you serve and you care for those around you. That is the role that you have. And that role may change. And, and, and the ultimate end of this is when Jesus returns, we will be with him for eternity. But in the time, in that space between the time you're born and the time you go, I don't know specifically what story God has for you, but it involves this, to love God and to love your neighbor. 
my hope and my prayer today is, is that as you continue to experience God's love, that as you come into this place and as we remember our baptisms and the love that God has shown us there, as we remember and as we receive the Lord's Supper when that happens, as you hear God's grace announced with that confession and absolution, that as you know the love of Jesus, you are filled to go out from this place that we would share that love, that we would transform this county. This is the place that God has put us. He hasn't put us anywhere else right now. He may have other plans. I don't know what those are or when those will happen. But now, God has called us to love him and to love our neighbor as we, as we serve him in this time and place. May he continue to fill us with his spirit, to trust his plan that no matter what happens, he is leading and guiding us, that our journey ends with him for all eternity in his presence. And in the meantime, we continue to love our neighbor as he has loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. And may the peace of God then, which surpasses all understanding, may it keep your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus from now to life everlasting. Amen.